a very good evening to all the architects students academicians who have joined to today with us in the future of architecture 2021 future of architecture is a very interactive and a live platform which was created in 2020 just when the pandemic started it was a one day event where we called eminent architects from tamil nadu to come and talk to students and architects today this time we are in the fourth episode of future of architecture 2021 and we are very glad that we have more than 1000 plus registrations and so many students who have written to us asking a lot of different questions future of architecture is a joint event of rvs chennai in association with manipal university jaipur and sushant school of art and architecture gurugram we are very proud to say that so many uh, students and architects and academicians have written to us and today we have with this architect chitra, chitra vishwanathan ma'am from bayom a small introduction about rvs chennai padmavati school of architecture rvs chennai padmavati school of architecture is also known as tasa the alternative school of architecture we strive to create diversity and we try to make sure that a lot of different ideas are brought into the academic syllabus and architectural education is extremely innovative in the approach that we do we strive to make sure that our entire academic syllabus is based on five strong pillars where we have based our architectural education to work the first pillar that we focus on is called the school of change a platform where we try to innovate academics within the limitations that we have we try to develop new ideas create new opportunities and create more exposure for the students to learn understand and develop new ideologies the second in this school of change we have five different wings each academic year is divided into a wing so two semesters together is made into one complete year with a theme each theme being focused towards the academics and the design brief of each semester the second pillar that we mainly focus ourselves is called the live project where students are directly involved in the construction of a project for at least one month across one academic year we have successfully been able to create a senior citizens library in surat and eco cottage in tirunamalai the idea of live project is for students to understand the relationship between construction and design being able to understand the transformation of a building from paper into reality the third pillar is called the vertical studio which is an exclusive student exchange program between rvs chennai and various other institutions where rvs has an mou signed with we have completed uh, a vertical studio with sushant school of architecture azadi kochi niti mangalore and we are in progress to developing this short term process this program focuses towards creating new ideas solving serious problems in students working together as a team as a design entity the fourth pillar which we focus ourselves is called the summer winter school which is a travel based learning program where students get to travel and work with architects and also in the allied fields of architecture and design for students to be able to follow their heart follow their passion and identify their skills and be able to pursue their passion and interest in the field of architecture as we all know architecture is a diverse platform and summer winter school helps the students to diverge into these uh, different platforms and understand about the variety that architecture as an education can perform the fifth pillar and the most important pillar is called the finishing school where we try to make the students industry ready to bridge the gap between academics and practice by inviting firms by inviting product industries by inviting architectural products by inviting inviting architectural institutions to come and work alongside and teaching them relevant and most important tools that makes them extremely ready to be able to face the market face the industry and also be prepared for their future so finishing school works in ways that generally has evolved into a platform where such interactions like future of architecture also happens we have also created a platform called travel team studios which is a unique curriculum that we have created for the first semester students to be able to travel on the cultural and uh, important nature aspect of tamil nadu so every year we take up a theme kurunji mullai marudam neidal and we travel and this travel completely essentializes the understanding of a student as a beginning and introduction into architecture and we were able to do a travel team studio called mullai for the current 2020 batch as well in the month of february and it turned out to be a very very great learning experience and we believe that such an exposure is extremely important for a student as he joins architecture the next important strategy or the program that we have kick started is agriculture we can proudly say that we are india's first architecture college to integrate agriculture within our academic syllabus and also dedicate a set of land for students to practice agriculture we've call it agriculture plus architecture agritecture when a five years of rvs a student goes through this five years he is going to be able to understand and be able to be a farmer in himself and we believe that is extremely essential for the students 
to be able to understand the importance of agriculture in their day-to-day -day lives. We have also been able to do something called a life project in Andhra Pradesh along with Proto Village. The students live on a sustainable platform. They understand how the living works and they're able to essentialize the important aspects of life rather than being in an urban environment alone. And this life project shapes the minds of these young kids and making them adaptable and ideate in different environments. We have also created a sustainable nature campus, which is our uh, vision project where we want to convert our entire architecture campus into a nature campus, showcasing different kinds of building materials and try to be able to make it a live experimental school for students from across the country, from across the globe to come, learn, build, and actually be able to build something hands-on rather than just design. So our nature campus is our most essential product that we have created, which we are very proud about. We have also created something called the Quarantine Gurukulam, which was an exclusive platform that came as a result of pandemic. We wanted to integrate the principles of Gurukulam and how we could do it in quarantine. And we have conducted a lot of different sessions, talks, and various series under this platform, which is all available on our website. And the last and the most important thing that happened this year is the Center for Design and Innovation. We have created an exclusive space in the city of Chennai, South India's first space, which is dedicated for architects, architecture institutions, and product and architecture industries to come together where they can learn and we can exchange ideas and develop. And we are very happy that this center is kickstarted and is going on. And we invite all the architects and students to be a part of the Center for Design and Innovation. And we are really proud that we have been able to do so much in the last one academic year. And we are waiting to explore new. And I'm very sure that many students are also waiting to take this entire event forward. Now, moving on to the event, Future of Architecture 2021, episode four. Today, we have with us architect Shishya Sutra Vishwanathan, ma'am, uh, who is somebody that I think every architect as a student, uh, you know, would have looked up to and would have definitely gone to one of their buildings for case studies, understood about it. So a small brief about Chitra, ma'am. Chitra, ma'am, was born in Banaras, India. She has lived across many cities, few being Banaras, Ochi in Nigeria, Ahmedabad, Delhi, Panjim, Kochi, and now Bangalore. She calls Bangalore her home now. She's graduated from the School of Architecture, SEPT Ahmedabad, and studied civil engineering at Auchi Polytechnic, Nigeria. After her graduation in 1989, she moved to Bangalore and started her firm, Chitra Vishwanathan Architects, in 1991. In 2008, the firm changed its name to Biome Environmental Solutions. It was uh, since it was felt that the practice is a collaborative one and in order to emphasize the collaborative nature of the practice, which addresses ecological issues through design as its primary focus. Biome has won many notable awards, uh, IAA awards, two AA awards, a Rethinking the Future awards. And Chitra Ma'am has also lectured extensively in India and abroad. She was also the Charles Korea Chair at Goa School of Architecture in 2017 for the Housing Studio. She has curated the Interaction Forum and was part of the jury for the 2A Awards 2019 Madrid. Chitra Ma'am is currently a tutor for the Monsoon 2020 L3 Studio at SEPT and an adjunct visiting faculty in the Department of Architecture and Design, Manipal University. Uh, Ma'am is very passionate about designing for disabilities and she also works for an NGO called Kikili in making place spaces accessible. And that's a small brief about Chitra Ma'am. So, ma'am, a very, very happy to have you with us today and a very good evening. Thank you for accepting our invitation for being a part of Future of Architecture 2021. Thank you, Anthony, and it's a great privilege. Thank you, ma'am. So, I would like to start this event by, you know, asking you to introduce yourself and your firm and about your practice just for a few minutes. So that because today we have actually so many questions, I have... I've been struggling to break those questions into 10 and 12 and bring it together. So a small brief about yourself and about the firm and we can directly jump into asking the questions. Now. Yeah, so, so you've done the part about me. You've told where I studied and where I am now based. So I would rather talk about the firm. The firm is now sure. 30 years old, but uh, from 2008 is the firm when more people joined. I worked for about 15 years. No, I, I must say I worked for five years all alone. But after that, <laughs> I always had somebody or other with me. So it's never been a practice which was just mine alone. And in 2008, when we all felt that it's, um, it's a practice we should go beyond the name of a person, we decided that it should be called biome. And why biome? Biome means ecology of a place because we work at designing ecosystems. We are trying to do it. It's not always that we only, we are so good at it, but we are trying to do that. And then we had colleagues who were with us for a 
long time. Some, and, and 2008 itself, they had worked for almost five years and taking a lot of responsibility and had power too. So we decided that uh, we will not only be a farm proprietorship, but it will become a private limited. So they are the senior uh, colleagues are shareholders in the whole venture, which is not only with the architecture part, but also the water vertical. Besides that, well, you could see that I'm sitting in the first earth house, we made a complete earth house, though the wall which you see behind is not earth, it's just a small piece of brick wall, but this is earth plaster and this is my house because it's, been, it's a day off. And I was influenced or I was um, made to study architecture because my father was a sculptor. So he has a sculpture he's made and the house is full of his sculptures and paintings. And he was studying his master's in sculpture in US, in University of Oregon. And that's where he came into contact with a new profession, which was a step further to art and further to architecture, he thought, which was architecture. And I, when he was in US, I was just five years old, but he decided that his daughter would study architecture. So every time he was being molding me to think of buildings, and that's how I joined civil engineering in Nigeria, because he had gone there to set up a school of fine arts in a polytechnic. And uh, I ended up joining civil engineering, came back, and then joined SEPT in Antabad and studied there and then got married to a phenomenal person who is Vishwanath. And I'm not Vishwanathan, I'm Vishwanath, but the Tamilians always end up calling me Vishwanathan, which is okay. But, um, so Vishwanath is was studying urban planning in SEPT and we met, we got married, and that's how I moved to Bangalore. And this is the only city where I lived the longest. That's almost 30 years. So I call it my home. And the city is the responsible character in this drama, in this journey of our ecological architecture. So I end up with that. And, you know, all credit to the city, its people, and the great family here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think uh, that's very nice because calling a city home, I think everyone who's grown up, you know, uh, has a background and a connect to the city that they are from. And it's always uh, a pleasure to be in the city. Like, you know, for me, Chennai has been where I've been all my life. Yeah. Like travel for a week and I come back. I think it's really nice to be back home. So yeah. I'm very glad uh, that Bangalore has been an influence on you. I, uh, so now we will get on to the questions uh, yeah. asking you. The questions we have, I have mostly filtered very straightforward, very simple questions which ask about your projects and practice because in Future of Architecture, we want to know on the other side of the firm, we want to know about the uh, different aspects of the firm rather than just know about the projects because most of your projects is something that we've seen. So we'll move on to the first question. Uh, it's a very um, straight question that came in multiple um, views. So I'm going to ask that directly. We have seen your works being published in many places. By places, I mean articles, journals, you know, in the many websites. But are you okay to be branded as a sustainable architect, or how do you how do you see this? Is this like a pressure on you, or is it like a brand that you you know would like to carry, or how do you? What is your reaction when people brand you as a sustainable architect? So they can't brand me as sustainable architect at all. So I don't agree to that, you know, because I would say like again more than as a person, I'd rather talk about the practice and practice as the agency, the biome as the agency, should be called as a practice which tries its best to work on ecological, ecological sphere of making architecture. And you know, you're seeing this as something different only because right now we're filled with unecological designs. We see too much of it. Whereas if we see the early architecture, even the practice like of doshis or chayas, or koreas also, they were all ecological. They were all rooted in the climate, the material available and or baker. So it was all 
ecological, and I would talk about the difference between ecological and sustainable later. So it's not anything new we are doing. What we have found, or I would say what how we have improvised is that we noticed in Bangalore, there was this earth which was extremely good for construction. And there was an ecosystem from Indian Institute of Science which could teach us. And we just married the two. And like I said in the beginning, the people in Bangalore were ready to invest on us who didn't know exactly how the construction could be done, but they invested in us to allow us to make those structures because of the ecosystem backing of Indian Institute of Science and its civil engineering department. And then also because we came up with good design and that was most important. Then we saw the various crises in the city and incorporated that in designing a building which would help in mitigating the crisis. The first one was water. So getting all this together makes for, for a building to be an ecosystem. And why do I not like sustainable? Because sustainable, the word is limiting. For me, my house of about 1,500 square feet is sustainable. It's, it's probably too big for just two people. Many people would come and say, how can we live in such a large house? And it's probably too small for somebody who would probably live in a 23-floored house. So sustainable is a shifting goalpost. So I'd rather call it ecological because ecological embodies ecology, economics, and most importantly, logic. So call us ecological practice rather than sustainable practice. Yeah, sure, ma'am. I think uh, that's a very you know, interesting uh, answer that you've given me. And I think that is also going so, to ask a lot of questions. Hi. Yeah. Hi. We so please, please allow for these interruptions. The neighbors get, don't have a grandchild yet. Yes. Amela, but yeah. Close my bit open. Hey, listen, listen. See ya. She leaves the door open. Huh? Close my. Yeah. Sorry about it, but this will happen. Okay, yeah. No, no, that's fine. I think that makes it more uh, interactive <laughs> also. Yeah. And so we think, so you've made it very clear that sustainable is a shifting goalpost, while ecology, you know, being ecological is not. So I'm going to ask you another second question, which is, you know, something that many people, do you think, you know, architects as a profession, as a person or as a firm are powerful enough to contribute to climate change, considering the fact that we are a very small, minuscule profession in the country in the number of people who pass out, number of architects that are coming out. Do you think we are powerful in order to contribute to climate change? Because many people, many architects, or let's say many uh, civil engineers, or many people I speak to say, the one building I build is not going to contribute much. You know, I am not even doing something large enough to have any contribution. So the question is, do you think as architects, because many students are listening to this, do you think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well... I was on Instagram and had saved an article from, I forget which um, place, I wire or print or economist. But now this is what I call as tyranny of small decisions. If one person adds one AC, the other person adds one more AC because it's comfortable, we are really adding to the increase in the temperature in the city, in that space. Now, can you believe Bangalore, it's 22 degrees centigrade throughout the year almost, that my neighbor has two ACs right next to each other because they can afford, you know, you can afford, and the hedonism plays a large part in Bangalore when you have ACs. But AC use would increase to 55% of the population and that's because we're making bad buildings. We're making buildings with glass, which are trapping in heat. Well, we could obviously use glass, which would reflect off the UV rays, but then that will heat up the outside. So any decision we take, even as individuals, we are contributing to climate change. 
And note this, the IPCC report, which has just come about a week back, it's already said, this is the hottest year in, hun hottest year in 100 years, but this is also the coolest year in the coming 100 years. So can you believe what's happening? You, you, we are seeing flooding, we are seeing fires all over the world. We are in a bubble. If you say we are fine, we are not. So we do contribute to climate change and it's our responsibility to mitigate the same and work at it. Now, uh, you know, since this has come up as a question, I would like to just ask one more thing. Um, the amount of buildings that architects design are also much, much, much lesser, very less compared to the amount of buildings that are being built. So moving on to the next question, this let this be in the background. So because I always feel that, like you say, you know, the tyranny of change and it's important. So I'm going to ask you a question. Now, this question is very, very uh, direct. I just want you to react to the different materials that I'm going to be listing here. So your reaction to the following materials, because this came out very excitingly as a question. Many students asked us that, you know, what, what does Chitra ma'am think about this? What this? So we put everything together. So what is your reaction to when, you know, as you see a building which is fully in concrete, the walls, the facade, the flooring, especially as a material of style, how do you react to a building like that? Yeah, I have a problem with everything being a material for style rather than for with reasons. So I'm somebody who always, like I said, it's ecological, so logic trumps style. Uh, so concrete for walls is in fact a, hugely erroneous use, especially in low-rise structures. If you're going to do, and still in India, 60% of the buildings are ground plus two or three max, they all can be load-bearing. And if you're going to end up using a material which has high embodied energy, then it's not fair. So, so fashion like is very expensive. Okay. Yeah, so fashion, very expensive and not fair. So concrete, not fair. So next one is glass as a facade material, which is the fancy rendering object at the moment at most of the visualizations of the building. So what is your reaction to glass as a material that is used in the facade? In India, as a material that could be avoided, glass could be avoided for one reason. It just traps in the heat. We are in a tropic. We are in tropics. It's in, probably in Ladakh you could use it so that it uh, brings in heat. But in the rest of India, it could be avoided. And then, what do you see from that glass? I'm sorry to say, our cities are so bad. <laughs> and like, I was in this uh, first one RTPCR test. I went to a building and had the glass facade. Well, it was nice, huh? glass facade, and you had the name of the testing facility, and between that, there was an ecosystem full of spiders, <laughs> and which we could see. And uh, well, maybe you should make that as a reason to have glass facade, so it could be avoided, yeah. So the next uh, material is uh, brick cladding. So now this came out very excitingly. So it was actually written to us in the question as, cladding a wall made out of brick with brick to make sure that it is, you know, looking like brick. I think you get the entire, it is very nice. They do a brick wall and then they plaster it and then they clad it with brick. So what, how do you react to that as an, as an aesthetic so, feature? Yeah, well, that's one small short question back, why? Uh, but, <laughs> so then with this question comes the importance of understanding as to why people want like that. So people have emotional connect, connect to the buildings they make. No? So they must be making these brick buildings in Chennai, but the picture they've taken from Pinterest is in somewhere in UK, no? in London. So they want this brick building. Although you can't avoid it. So you, you put those brick facade and then after a few days it falls off because you did a very bad job with it and it get, goes back to the original. But then the original, they can't expose it because those bricks are not good. See, so there's this whole clash. The clash of uh, one's aspiration of taste, okay? It's not... And sad state of construction material available and then you don't have budget to buy the most expensive brick and if 
they end up end up employing us as the architects. We would say, no, that's high embodied energy. So you can't bring it support chats. They go for this. But these are conversations and architects should all the time have and see and work at negotiations. <laughs> so the next one is very simple material. It's the aesthetic use of the new age jali, terracotta jali that we can see in so many different places. Yeah. So I'm happy to see it coming back, though I'm all going to question where it is used and why it is used, and this debate can continue. Because many a times there is this terracotta jelly and there's glass behind it. Yeah, definitely. So in a way, we are fine that the glass is not going to get heated that much, but the jelly is not doing its work. So the next one is. Uh, I'm a, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. Anthony. We've used jali. We have used jali, okay, and yeah. terracotta jali. We've used it on the roof because we designed our our office and the uh, second floor, which was added onto a 20 year, year plus foundation. So we decided the roof should be light. So we didn't want to do concrete. So my colleague Sharat Naik had the brilliant idea for using GI sheet. But now that GI sheet will get very hot. Even in Bangalore, you, get, you know, it can get hot. So he designed it in such a way that there's jali on top, which shades the GI sheet, but allows for the rainwater to go through it and which we can collect. So that's what's not happening now. It's like the question says, it's an aesthetic material. It's an aesthetic choice. The present fashion trend, yeah. So the next one is uh, lack of sun shades in most of the windows that we see in a lot of the modern buildings. How do you respond to that? The sun shades. I know that there are a lot of, lot of leakage issues, but this option that they came up with is sun shades, no, no need of sun shades, have windows which are aluminium windows. What do you think about that? Yes, yeah, a lot of these have been also um promoted by cost cutting okay. it's not always been a decision of ecology or aesthetics alone it's the builders who were making these uh, homes you know if you save on uh, sunshade it's a lot of saving in terms of form work concrete etc and aluminum windows are cheaper and it won't um, leak at least they assure you that but it's citizens who pay through heat island effect and urban flooding, because now if you have these aluminum windows, which are not designed very well, and so you keep them closed in the rains, and then in Chennai, you get very hot and humid inside, so you put on an AC, so you throw out more heat, you create heat island, and then more urban flooding. So even a simple sunshade is an important feature and it's needed. How you design your windows are important. And we are not learning. If we look at some examples, there is a building in um, Singapore, which even won the Aga Khan Award. I forget the name, but it, it has a beautiful windows design so that it allowed for openings to happen in that humid climate from below. And this is also designed by Korea here in Bangalore, in the utility towers. So air would come from below and you could still leave the windows open and you didn't have to do chacha. So then need to work at uh, innovations if you want to avoid certain aspects of uh, elements of construction, but it's most needed in tropical climate. So we have two more materials. I'm just going to run it yeah. quite fast. So the two materials are that we had in one of the questions was, the entire building being in marble or the entire wall being cladded fully and also the same language used for aluminum composite panel. So how do you react to those two materials? Yeah, so any, um, again, going back to complete cladding, it could be marble, it could be granite. So I have difficulties accepting falsities. I would rather than merely have a plaster and a bit of paint, but cladding. But also people choose cladding is so that it's maintenance free. So we need to understand why the person is using. 
so it's difficult but then please do understand and then like i said the beginning is conversations and uh, negotiations aluminum panels i haven't worked on any project by the way no project have i used cladding except in the toilets in most of the designs but uh, aluminum panels are never used so i have not even understood why people use it but what i'm trying to say through this is that <clears throat> i'm not averse to not using a certain material or a certain construction element and stuff because i want to first know why because it's been asked and then how to decide that we can help without taking that step so let's take back we'll go back to the cladding why is the cladding used say so sometimes to show the wealth that's a different aspect of but suppose it's for reducing maintenance how could we do that through design now if we go on adopting the way a western architecture is adopted in india which is making a box it doesn't work in india the way the rain falls and the kind of structures we make the walls get spoiled and so we want to avoid painting all the time that's why we want to clad in china if you go it will be cladded with uh, tiles all over they don't use marble but they use tiles instead if we work at roof projections we don't have to maintain our walls at all nothing would happen so we build with stabilized earth in bangalore where it rains 900 mm we work at roof projections and there is absolutely no maintenance required for the walls then we maintain it for the parapets but that's okay yeah so thank you for that extensive answer and your reactions for each of the materials man because this was something that many people had asked so the next question is very relevant to uh, what we had shared earlier so now uh, this comes in as a pressure question from many students or young practices or even senior practices architects are equally responsible as clients for bad buildings uh, yes or no uh, and i'm just going to elaborate on the kind of context that the question came in it was mostly asking you know i had given a better design i had generally given a design that is really good but it did not work out they said no the government is not agreeing to it so this kind of question we had so many questions so i just wanted to know how you know you would react to something like that architects are equally responsible for bad buildings as much as we blame the you know the ball on the client side so yeah well when when you take the credit then then you should be ready to take the d the credit also you know somewhere where you so it's a team effort to make a good or a bad building it's not of the client alone or the government alone but it happens so you learn it through time you learn through time to avoid taking those decisions or those kind of projects where it is stultifying you it's not allowing you to probably explore your potential and also at the same time if you're open to the fact that maybe there is reasoning why the client is asking a certain things and i could probably adopt and adapt to make it better which i would like to see later after a few years when i go back i'd like to see the building and feel happy but um there all you know the whole lot of things which make you an architect it's not just that one building you have to keep trying you have to keep improving your skill because you see them as uh, people giving you chances to explore the possibilities and it's just that and i know and it's okay not to like the building you made and it's okay if it's it's come out bad but important is that you learn from it and don't repeat it that's the most important part don't repeat it so now that we've asked that question the next one is uh, no i think there is a nice continuity to all this uh, has there been a time when you i can't hear you uh, am i audible 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah. Has there been a time when you said no to a client because it did not match your principles or it did not work with your idea? For example, if some client wanted an air conditioned space fully, so has there been a time when you said no? So that's what I've been always saying. There is always conversation and negotiations. Negotiation becomes important. You have to understand the person, where the person is coming from. The person saying they need AC, then you negotiate and you say, no, you're making tall ceilings and it will be much cooler. And you may going to make this small space which you can AC, but still make it so well that they don't feel like you, they need AC. Keep talking about it, keep giving them inputs on how it's bad for their knees and other things. But if a person is, let's say, is a pilot and is flying all the time and then comes home, wants a cool place where they can rest, I don't think then you say, no, we can't give you AC, you have to suffer, you can't get seen, or as a doctor or a surgeon, and they need that. So then you still talk to it then and work out a design. And then you explore the various possibilities of cooling the space. Even if you are thinking of using a mechanical means, there are still many other ways you can cool without having to use the energy as much as you're thinking in other places. Besides that, uh, you, uh, I, we, didn't, we haven't had the chance to say no to a client because they didn't agree to principle because most of the time they're coming, they're seeking us out because we work on such principles. So we, in the beginning, if people came to us and they didn't know well about our principles, then we had, we had to take the time to make them aware of it. But what helped us is that whenever and wherever we have had our office, whether it was in the home, in the basement, to the present office, it's always been the way we would like our buildings to be. So it, we talk, we have walked the talk with our own spaces to tell the client what we do. It's not been that difficult for us. So uh, I think the context of the question comes in in a way that many architects feel that it is a little difficult to convince the client. So that is, I think, the place where the you know the question had come from so yeah. i think in the beginning in the beginning of your career when you started off your office it would have definitely been difficult you would have lost a few projects you know definitely i think that there would be something that would have happened yeah so i'll, I'll give a small context so the first five years from 19 from 2011 oh where is it sorry 19 when did i start 19 1991. 1991. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that too. Yeah. So 1991 to about 1995, it was mostly economical constructions because Bangalore was looking at uh, small homes and they wanted whatever Laurie Baker was uh, doing in Kerala, they knew about it and we were building with mostly with uh, rat trap bond. And then combining it with the roofing systems designed in, um, in the Institute of Science. So it was always working at reducing cost. And then we built our own place. And at that time, it was the peri-urban area of Bangalore. Then it was like, a, it was easy. By the way, when we were building our own space, I was doing 22 houses. So I've had the problem of plenty rather than problem of less. Because it's Bangalore, because of its people who are so open and they're so well-read that I think people in Bangalore have challenged us more than them saying no to our ideas. They said, why can't you do this too? So every time we have needed that, there should be some patron challenging us and we try something new. So, sorry to say that, but we haven't had those kind of hurdles where people to have to convince people. And that's again to the city of Bangalore. So when after we built our house, in fact, while building our house itself, we were building two, three other small homes nearby. And we worked on small and we worked on homes. And it's very important because then you learn the width of thinking of what happens because you're, you're doing at a time, 20 homes. 
and they're very small. So details are really worked harder upon. So we developed it like that. So our practice has gone from this grind of small and they and it's been through word of mouth. Might have done a, I must tell you this uh, anecdote. So we did a small addition we turned a toilet into a kitchen and the garage into a dining for a lawyer. And he talked to a builder who wanted a clubhouse that, why do you want to go to a big architect, go to these people? They are creative. And we got a large clubhouse to design. And then now we're working with a builder all the time, designing homes, apartments, etc. Et a small house in the farm becomes a large our native village, the first ecological resort in India with uh, biopool, et cetera, et cetera. So we have invested a lot to work with people and to work on small projects where we have honed the skills of our design as well as construction. So the construction and design go hand in hand. Most architects in my office, they know how to construct. So wherever they go, right now we're designing in Madhya Pradesh, they know how to construct. They can work with people there and do it. All that makes it that it's easy to talk to clients. I'm sorry whether I've digressed from the whole question. No, no, no. I think uh, it's important yeah. for us to understand such experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's nice to see that yeah, uh, you know, a toilet to a kitchen to a garage to a large resort is a kind of transition that every architect looks for. And it's nice to see that small really matters. I think that's something that we should take. And 22 buildings in, <laughs> at the same time is quite stressful. Yeah, yeah, at least. yeah, yeah. It, was, it was. And I was alone at that time. And I would have a Luna and going around the whole city. And I was doing my own house. So I used to say, you know, I can't do all the details I'd like to do because I have no time. And I have a baby too, a five-year-old baby too. But this was, that that's the thing is that basically most of the time one didn't have time to lament upon because one was so busy. It's really nice to know that, you know, that's a very essential starting. And I think many firms also have a very interesting story yeah. of how they started. So moving on to another question, which was uh, something about your buildings that came to us. So I'm going to ask that question. Uh, we, we've not sugarcoated any of the questions that came. We're trying to make it as straight as possible. So uh, many people say that this is this is exactly almost how we got it. Many people say that your building looks similar. Does that bother you? And how do you react to it? So <laughs> that's a chitra, that's a biome building, you know. That's yeah. a, that's yeah. I think that the architect is, you know, architect chitra, and that's a biome building or something. Like yeah. How do you th take it? So feel good about it, and I find the question interesting and slightly childish too. But I feel good about it. Yeah, when people see the building and they say that's biome building, um, it's probably because we started using this material early on when people were not even aware of this as being a material which could be used by architects. I've been told that this is not architecture because for most part architecture was RCC and brick buildings, but this was different. But you know, I would say that now there are more people using this material, because it's the material palette which defines us most of the time. There are more people using these materials and if they do as well, as well detailed building as we do, we, keep, we want to say that, it will be very difficult to say this is a biome building. This may be a biome influence building, but it may not be a biome building. And we look forward to such an ecological future. If we look forward to the fact that we have given a language, a language of possibility of a material which could be used, used as in urban context. Most importantly for me, I would say is that having used this material and this way of construction in urban context, and for homes, which were first homes, they were not second homes for some rich millionaire who wanted a mud 
farmhouse somewhere, you know. It was a home for, like the second home I did here was for a lady working in a bank and had a small plot of 30 by 40. And there we made a small home. So if the more like that, it may be biome influence, but may not be biome and we look forward to this. Uh, uh, I also think that uh, many buildings of yours that we've seen is like a reference that many architects choose and very soon we're going to have a lot of biome influence buildings and that's the trend you know we can see CSCB as a material uh, taking over construction in, in very urban areas like you exactly mentioned not the second home so that's I think a thanks to the you know, biome as a team you but know I have to... one point more yeah. if you if somebody will be more discerning they would see Chitra, Martin, Mona, Sharath, Anurag, Siddharth in them. But that will take some time. And that's how it is because I had a talk with Hannah Abdel of uh, Art Daily and she would say you have one philosophy but you see different people in the design. So that I think if people, a mature person would see that the, that the designer is different. They're using the same philosophy. Yeah, I think uh, the current um, entire platform of architectural websites and this is very visual in nature. And I'm very sure that so much information on social media as well is going to go to the next level of analyzing it. And when we go into that depth, I'm pretty sure everything is going to be more clear. And that's exactly the next question also that we have for you. Exactly. Uh, it is uh, Biome as a team is very diverse and very unique, you know, going through your website, the kind of people that are engaged. Why or what influence, you know, generally the office structure of many um, contemporary firms do not have people from so many different backgrounds, do not have so many people. And uh, I've, I'm so excited to see that all people who are working, uh, you know, the people who are cooking for you, the people who are working with you, everyone is a part of your website and a team. So I just wanted to know Biome as a team is very diverse and unique. What or why, you know, did you want or did you visualize it to be like that? You know, what does biome mean? Biome means ecology of a place. So ecology of a place is not just that place. No? It's flora, fauna, everything. Now in an office, you need everybody. You need people who will manage accounts. Obviously, as architects, we don't know all the laws and uh, all the other issues which come through in accounting. So you need them. You need, uh, we, we always went with, quantity surveys in the office. We found that most important because the way we approach our design and also the way we interacted with the clients was that we will not only give you a design, we will also give you an estimate, the idea of the cost of the building, which is very important for us because most of our first clients were uh, with very tight budgets, but they wanted something different. So we couldn't disappoint them. We, we had to keep the fact that we we'll reduce the cost as most important factor in the design while we are building with earth, while we are doing rainwater harvesting and other inputs into the design. So costing was done in the office and that was learned through working in the site by the engineers at the office and evolved. So we prepared our own estimate. So the QS is an important team in the office. Then um, architects then my husband works on water, but there's a whole team for water. The civil engineers and in fact, even architects who are working only on water design. And they work on water designs, not only for us, but also not only for biome architecture, but for others too. And in fact, most of the biome architectures, water designs are done by the architects themselves. And it's an important factor that they know that they have to do it themselves. Then we were in the peri-urban area and then people joined us. There was no place to eat in this place called Vidya Ranyapura, except one small bakery. So we decided uh, when we are having our food made, we'll have extra made and everybody will eat. And that became the way we wanted to work all the time. And we, it also became the fact that, you know, at least one meal is good meal by the for the people who are in the office because most architects are not they don't really work in the very city they they stay in they want to go out and work and so many of our architects 
were from different cities. Going back and cooking was difficult, so we decided to have lunch. Then people started working late and all sorts of rubbish would come to the office, so we decided we have snacks also in the office. So that's how it became very important to showcase the people Usha and Gayatri in our website because they're an integral part. You can't be in Bayon without the food they give you. So that's why the diverse team. And so now having a team as diverse as that is um, what the, you know, is generally a question that many young forms have asked. I'm not just about the team. I it's a, It's about... You know, a diverse team usually is also not just a diverse team. I think any large team is a large financial burden too. How do you strategize this as an office? Both. One moment. No, 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 no problem. Yes. No, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So a diverse team usually is also a large financial burden. How do you strategize this as an office, both financially and emotionally, especially during the pandemic? This is a question that comes from many young firms who have started their firms and have fought through the pandemic in the last one year. So this is a question which is on those lines. Yeah. You know, every entrepreneur, especially in this country and this day, is financially burdened. We get no help. As an entrepreneur, we might be employing, like in my office itself, we are about 30 people in the office and through our work, probably 300 people are getting employed, but we get nothing from the government. So. It, <laughs> architecture is work of passion, not of really making money. But what has happened is that uh, we have kept everybody responsible for the design they do. So almost everyone in the office would know how much comes in and how much goes out and how one is managing the monies, especially during the pandemic too. Is, are we breaking FTs? Are we not breaking FTs? What's happening? How much is left next month? So everyone is supposed to look at their projects and see the outflow required in that month and work at billing. So the idea is always is that keep working and sending the drawings across so that we can bill. This is an important factor known to the Almost in the inter. What all she's taking off. Yeah. So, and besides that is also when the people in the office feel that they're part of a team, they understand it better. And they're not, they're not supposed to be seen as a, a workforce. And so here I digress, you know, I've seen this hundreds of cartoons where it's shown that the architect, the main architect, like let's say it's me, is you know, like in one Anant Shaina pose over the pyramid and it's the younger architect who are working and supporting the office and the lifestyle of that architect, which is very erroneous. And it, it doesn't pay, fa well, pay back the fact that that person has worked hard enough that it's known or yeah, I'm sorry, the brother has come now. So it keeps happening and it's not fair at all. And people have worked, we've worked on something throughout the throughout 15 years before you start seeing even a little bit of profit. So what we do is that we Everybody in the office should know how much is coming this month and how are we going to share and what are we going to save and when are we going to break an FT if need be and also how are we going to buy a software if it's needed or not, etc. Et and so you have to give both financially, they should be made uh, what do you call it, secure as well as to be given power and responsibility. And I think that's how we do it. I'm sorry for the various disturbances, but I can't help. This okay. is the time they come in. And my husband- I, I just want to continue with this fine, ma'am. I just want to continue mm -hmm. on the same question. So this is like, you know, the fact that 
transparency within a firm you know between the uh, principal architect and the people who are working with him do you think that lack of transparency in many firms i'm not we're not going to be judging anybody but this is we know the kind of you know the means that you see the graphic that you see that lack of transparency is also one of the reasons that i feel is why um, the shift or jump from offices to offices or people moving away or finding it you know not being able to address this entire pandemic as a family is one of the reasons is what i feel what do you think about it because like you said your office you know you said everyone is responsible and all of us are in this together and we're going to run this together that culture is currently not very uh, available to the you know the large number of firms that started is what i feel the very personal take so yeah you know it's also stems from the fact that i'm very lazy in trying to manage money and stuff like that so it's easy when you say this is the money available then everybody does it no and personally and i'm not being immodest about it but personally i have kept my requirements quite low so i don't really need much but one has also enjoyed and worked and i've got possibilities because of work and of the past that one could travel or go somewhere even if you come to chennai to teach it feels good when you can travel which the younger people can't do the well, idea is that now you support them and say now you go and talk and that's what i want more and more in our offices that i stop speaking and it's my younger colleagues who are called more and get to know about it and that will be in a book which we are planning which we want to nice. take out so sure ma'am so i think uh, thank you for that very honestly saying how we have to be and how you've been working out from your office so the next one is a very generic question and it's also very essential we're going to get back to the topic of the war between sustainability and ecology you know that's going to continue so is there a difference in how we as indians see sustainability and how the westerners see it are we running away from our actual context it might be a little repetitive of what i asked earlier but this is something that we got now are we are we ignoring our context or do you think we are moving away we want a very westernized sustainable notion and uh, you know certificates i think in india we always look forward to that uh, certificate from the west as uh, i heard christopher completely when he was talking and like he said don't run to europe or us to study masters do it in india you know the context better but we always are looking for that affirmation from westerners that we are doing good but uh, yesterday rahul narotra was saying that in our practices there are things which we can learn from western context and the things which we can learn from local so we have to heighten both we have to heighten the local we have to heighten the global and how do we do it what is good there and what, what we should adopt is something we should be open to it no architecture has been done which wasn't influenced the churches in chennai so you're building a church but they used well foundation which is very much what the masons in chennai used to do the buildings with and that well foundation now we are using in many parts in bangalore when we design so there is this kind of a melange happening the mix happening of architecture all the time so let's not get into these binaries of western and indian and then again we question what is indian then we start questioning this is tamil nadu this is karnataka then in tamil nadu this is mahabalipuram and that's uh, trichy so it, it, i don't think this day and age we can be so very provincial i think there's enough to learn from each other and employ it right that's sure. all i would say and i don't think we should be worried about these binaries yeah thank you ma'am i think uh, that clears so many doubts and questions from so many questions itself and uh, it's right to it's it's, a, it's very um, apt to also say that this field has been constantly evolving and we are getting inspired left right and center hmm. so nothing wrong about it but yeah. we should be very contextual as what we all want to do yeah. so now I mean, let's see baker 
Baker brought rat trap bond to India. If you read Mackey, rat trap bond is made for compound walls. It, mm. it, that's a bonding given in Mackey in brickwork for compound walls, which was in Britain, because Mackey is everything what was practiced in Britain. And he brought it yeah. here. And it became almost de rigueur in Kerala. Now, would you say it's Kerala or is it UK? <laughs> See, you can keep it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's, it's a very um, apt example as well. So I'm, I'm going to go on and ask the next one. This is something that uh, also many students have asked. The current generation of young architects are obsessed with technology at so many levels. Uh, technology is leading the way. How do you see the role of technology towards a sustainable, let's say, I'm, I'm just moving towards an ecological future? <laughs> yeah. First thing is technology is here to stay. So adopt it, use it to its best possibility. Now, suppose if we put the digital rain collection system on your roof in your area. Now you know how much it's um, raining in North Bangalore, how much it's raining in South Bangalore, and then you can kind of decide what is to be done. Use technology for that. Do use technology to understand the soil, the soil profile, and how would you make a foundation out of it. The ways you can use technology. And yes, the clients will ask you technology so that they can switch on the lights with the phone, fine. But that probably is a great thing if you're designing for disabled. So do learn it. It's basically don't close yourself. Don't go with blinkers on that you don't want to use technology. I think technology has its place and we need to learn. As architects, we are in this uh, profession, we're always learning and we have to keep learning and please, Learn about technology it's as important. And so there's nothing to say, anything wrong about knowing about technology. How to use, how you use it is something left to you. So, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, technology is here to stay. All of you students who wrote to us about technology. But it's right, you know, like ma'am had said, relevance is very important. You need to be relevant. And... Uh, it, it's, it's fascinating in the end, you know, even I work on some of the softwares and it's really cool to see what <laughs> yeah, is coming out yeah, of it. Yeah, and yeah, it is yeah. nice. Uh, but do you apply or imply technological devices or technological advancements in your project somewhere? If you can quote an example of how technology has affected the way you or in, influenced or you know, made it better in some aspects, like you gave an example. So if there is something that you can say, how you or the team as Biomed use yeah. technology. So... So we moved from hand drafting to AutoCAD very quickly. I use AutoCAD completely. I don't sketch. I'm not the kind who will be saying that, oh, you have to sketch it. Sketch is the last thing. It's the only way to do, you know? As, um, I remember when we were using ink pens, people were saying pencil drawing, you know, that kind. So people will keep saying that. So, uh, but I've not been able to adopt to Revit. The whole office is working on Revit. Because the feel, the 3D is resolved, but there is a lot of learning needed to be, and understanding needs to be of the technology. But besides that, what is the other technology in the office? Not really very much. It's, they still go up and down, climb up and down. We're not using any <laughs> technology to do that. The foot is cooked on gas, yeah, <laughs> but nothing else. <laughs> uh, I would be very eager to see how 3D printing technologies work, what one has read about is, um, is not getting the whole confidence that it is better because of the need of uh, certain resins and the, in terms of building a house, you also need too much of sand, sand is a big problem in our country. So whether we use 3D in that way, but the 3D bridge in Venice is very interesting with uh, Zahari's office thing. In fact, there were two Indians who were involved in it. Oh, I don't know. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sons of uh, architect Bhushan. Okay. The two sons, they're both in Zaha's office and they work with uh, 
parametrics quite a bit. And they started working with parametrics almost 20 years back. So they did amazing work. You know, the amount of material used has been so less and you can make these forms and bring it. And you see that bridge. It reminds you of uh, any other arches which were made where every stone was crafted to be in that place. Yes, and yes. here every unit was made crafted to be. So somewhere along the line, it's not really anything new, but you're using a different material and you're making it. So there's much to learn from technology and there's much need of it in every yeah. building. So, yeah. So I think uh, that's a very interesting example and we're looking forward to some 3D printing happening very uh, soon because it's taking over the entire, it's, it's, it's a good influence, I think. We have IIT Madras is working on a 3D printing concrete. They have mm -hmm. a missionary and we visited that and it's quite extensive, the kind of, you know, uh, innovation that they try and access from it, the approach that they take. So it, it's exciting to see the role of technology. So we'll move on. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, please. You have something to no, say. No, I'm saying you can't prevent human mind from thinking something more. Yeah. Yeah, so you can't prevent and they will keep doing it. But how we use it is something that we will have to keep working at. No, I think every time when some new technology comes in, that is going to be, you know, quite uh, parallel and you know, it's going to be used, exploited and then getting into the understanding of it. So I think that's, that's yeah. how it is. We are waiting for it to be explored. So uh, the next question that we want to move on is uh, something that came, it's uh, again, many, many small architecture firms of what have asked this question. So the question is also, how do you think I should charge for a project based on my years of experience or my idea, you know, the great idea that I've created? How do you think I should charge? This is a question we've asked almost all the architects who've come here yeah. in the future of architecture yeah. because every time we have any speaker, that is one of the questions that keeps coming to us, you know, how do I charge? You know, how do they charge? Or what is it I should do? Because I'm either designing, I'm giving the plan or I'm working on the site with them. So there are so many ways in which each architecture firm approaches it. So this is a question of how do you think I should charge for a project? Yes. Yeah, I, I heard what uh, Christopher said, too, but I keep uh, comparing the younger architects to you know the architects after doing sorry the the medical professionals after doing MBBS they go for five years and they're working in a rural space or when they're doing their MD they're working in a government hospital. And then you, you're not going to get much. You're getting a, probably a stipend of 15 or 30,000 rupees and you're managing and you're learning. So I think for the first few projects, you have to tell, tell that, please go, the glass bottle's falling. So you have to tell them that uh, you're capable. Wherever, I think for architects, best way that people know about you is through word of mouth. You have to be able to convince a client that you can do it. And if you do just one good work, it's quite easy in India to get good clients. But yes, there will be clients who will run away. They will not pay. I've stood in front of gates expecting the client to come. The phone doesn't ring or the phone is not being picked up. It's a part of living. But it's a, it's a, you know, architects have long shelf life. And you're still 90, you could be practicing and enjoying the work. Like Eisenman was asked, will you retire now? He said, what? At 77, I, I can design so much more faster than the rest in my office and better. How can I retire now? So please look at your profession of this nature, that it will be so. It will take some time. I think about five to 10 years you give, you will have a comfortable life and you will know how much you charge because by that time you would have done a time motion study is uh, how much time do you spend and you would have you would get a number for it too. so yeah thank you ma'am <laughs> uh we are, uh, this is going to continue but this the, i'm not going to ask a question because but that was something very common what is your expectations from an intern or someone who's applying as a pressure in your office what do you yeah i'm audible ma'am yeah yeah so, 
yeah what are the expectations from biome uh, you know from an intern or a recent graduate who's joining in and wanting to be a part of the you know? we need skills we definitely need you to be skilled and especially because everything is in revit so you need you should know revit you can't come and tell i i can draft with my hands very well sorry we don't even have drafting tables even i don't draft so you can forget and autocad is not enough so you need Uh, it. and you need the person to have a huge curiosity quotient so they should be curious enough to look at what's happening what are the various details because our work is a lot with details it's very important in this kind of architecture to not miss details so you have to understand and learn you have to almost learn the size of the brick and how it's used to every small stuff and finally you have to be part of a team so you have to talk you should be able to tell what you don't understand immediately and not take time so that the work can happen faster and better that's what we expect to be part of the team most importantly to have that capability so i think uh, all the students have gotten an idea as to what is being expected from them to be part mm -hmm. of the team of bio So I'm going to be asking the last question because we've covered almost everything, and you've answered extra, you know, to the questions that I had in mind as well. So this is one question which we got, you know, which architect or firm would you say that inspired you the most or really impresses you? You know, we would like, if it's possible, to name a firm or an architect that we. So if I could be Blaze, I would say I'm immodest. I'd say no to any one person. one has enjoyed looking at various art architects and various buildings and each building has inspired and some of the buildings or some of the projects anything is inspired it's even not by an architect it could be by a mystery and he's done something very interesting and a detail i'd love it so probably one should say if one wants to be philosophical its nature has been the best uh, influencer but no it, it, I have no one personality I would pay respect to. So you mean to say that there are many people and the list yeah. is long. Yeah, so. list is long and list is inexhaustible. It's it's there everywhere. Um, you just mentioned that your father was a sculptor, so there must be yeah. someone who inspired you. Uh, you know, in the beginning, in your early years, before being architect, or in the early years, you know, your bachelor's when you did your civil engineering, something like that. If there is, if there is something you remember, you or see. Yeah, I, I, you know, even when we were studying architecture, one didn't even kind of had that uh, aspiration that we'd have an office of one's own. So it's been a flow. So I really can't say that. Yeah, I decided yeah, to yeah. be an architect. No, yeah, this was very interesting, and you go and study architecture, and you got in. And the whole okay, I must. One thing I must confess that even though I'm from Banaras and my father was teaching in Bhutan, my biggest aspiration was to leave that city. Okay. That city is not for women. Horrible place to live in. So the, like, it was how many will I finish my course here in Banaras and leave this place? And then when we went to Ahmedabad and we loved it, and so didn't want to almost leave Ahmedabad. Spent eight years instead of five years there. and then came to bangalore so it's been a flow flow of, I, i've been like a sponge just taking in ideas and interests and moving around worked with gautam bhatia worked with um, sarto and for a year in cnt but then started on one so nice Various so uh, just moving around nice. so the inspiration is everywhere and i think you are someone yeah. who's more city the city gives you more to Yes, you know, be inspired from. So the last question, definitely the last question. Uh, this is a question that many young academicians, you know, young teachers, send. So many young architects have moved into teaching as a, a profession, and uh, you know, there is they're, they're very passionate, they're really committed, they're very fast as well. So that's really good. But what would you like to say as someone who's been in the field, where you know, I always believe that institutions' role are very important because they're going to be 
sending the students out into the fields to be practicing and perform. So, what would you like to say to these young teachers who are, you know, you know, are, you know, available in most of the institutions doing really interesting? What would you like to say to them? First thing I say, good luck to you, and please do an extremely serious job because you're doing a very important uh, job. You're contributing to the society. Uh, 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 most seriously, you may lack uh, professional experience, but I'm sure you should be able to influence the students and impart a knowledge in a way that they look at profession as something they'll take forward and probably not always go into only academics, but they'll look at something more. But keep making the students curiouser and curiouser and try to uh, be a bridge between academics and the profession. This, these teachers have to be creating the bridge. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. I think uh -huh. uh, many yeah. we have so many people who are listening. So uh, this is the end of the you know the questions that we had. Uh, I hope all the questions were intriguing and uh, there are so many uh, nice conversations that we had. So thank you for being with us today. And thank you for inspiring all of us by doing what you're doing. And I would like to also thank the entire team of Biome for inspiring us with really, uh, you know, relevant and important ecological buildings. It's always an inspiration. One of the students wrote to us, one of our senior, you know, pastor students wrote this. And I've been doing case studies of their building. So it's nice to listen to them talk. So you've been an inspiration as a firm, as a team. And uh, we are looking forward to collaborate with you and work with you, ma'am. And as RVS Chennai, I would also like to invite you to our center when you come to Chennai. When all the pandemic is over, please visit us at our Center for Design and we'll be really happy to have you here and interact. And I would also like, you know, that's something that I think personally, it's my request for you to come down to Chennai whenever you find, you know, the time. Sure, so, sure. and thank you for joining with us today. Uh, you, you know, in spite of it being a holiday, I think uh, I've taken away some very interesting time and we've learned a lot today. So thank, really? thank you, ma'am. Thank you a lot. Yeah. And I apologize for the interruptions, but I can't help that. No issue. Thank back. you, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And yeah. thank you all the people who've attended uh, the event who have been with us now. And uh, I think we'll meet you back again uh, on the next Saturday with another inspiring and um, you know interesting conversation with another architect. So thank you all. Thank you, thank everybody. You, thank you, Anthony. Bye-bye. Yeah.